Welcome to Grief Sucks, Life After Loss. I am your host, Linda, and I am here with Cindy today. Welcome, Cindy. Hi, Linda. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm great. It's Monday, you know, sun shining, start of a new week. It's going to be a good day. <laughs> yeah. My husband used to say I woke up breathing, so it's a good day. <laughs> yep. That's a plus, right? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you do and um, how you well, got there. I'm a life purpose and grief coach. Um, I started out working only with widows, but I've expanded now to anybody who's grieving for any reason, because I've had so many people ask me to do that. Uh -huh. um, you know, the grief, nobody gets through life without some grief. No. And... A lot of us, most of us are unprepared for it. We just don't know what to expect. We think we're crazy. You know, certain emotions or widow brain is a thing. Yes, yes, um, it is. Yes. And it lasts longer than pregnancy brain. Uh -huh. It la can last a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, for it's sure. 12 years for me and I still blame it. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but I, I got into it. My husband died 12 years ago. Uh, we'd been married just one month shy of 33 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a long time. And um, we would have celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary last year. I did okay-ish for several years after he died. I, you know, I was in active grief where I was crying every day and, you know, for a few weeks and then life happened, you know, and it kind of interrupted my grieving. So I thought, okay, I'm done. You know, I had to, I had things I had to do. I had to um, look for a new job because um, the company I was working for closed and I, um, we raised six sons and one lived in Colorado and he needed me for things going on in his life. And um, so after we got him straightened out, another son that lived four hours away from me, um, he, he needed me. And I kind of lived there the majority of the time and came back home every like weekends or every, you know, once or twice a month. Um, because I was their live-in chauffeur because neither he or his wife could uh, drive for a while for those years. But then things started looking up for them. So then I was back home. By that, that time, I was retired. Nobody needed me, and I had no reason to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And that was really hard. That's when I started. I got out of bed because if I stayed in bed, my back started hurting. <laughs> so I'd get out of bed and I'd either sit at my computer and play games or, you know, chat on Facebook or something, or I'd um, sit in my recliner and watch TV. And I realized, I mean, I would go a week without showering or even getting dressed. I'd be in my nightgown for a week. And I realized that that's not normal. So um, I talked to my doctor and I got very, very lucky that the first medications we tried worked for me. It doesn't for everybody. So if your doctor, put, you know, if your doc, you and your doctor agree that you might need medication, don't stop trying if the first ones don't work. You've got to, it can take some work to find the right combination and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it can help without making you feel like a zombie. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so that helped a lot, but I still, I was lacking a sense of purpose. I didn't, I didn't really know who I was anymore. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a wife, I wasn't a mother, and, you know, not full-time, you know, mommy, I need you. Right. Kind of. And, and I was retired. So I didn't know what to do. I tried a bunch of different things that were not right for me at all. Um, <laughs> I tried selling makeup. I don't wear makeup. So 
that didn't work out. Huh? <laughs> I mean, I, I did while I was doing it, but it just, it wasn't me. Yeah. Uh, then I sold wine for a while. That was fun. I'm not a good sales person though. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do well, but I still, you know, I met some nice people and we had a lot of fun. But it's hard uh, to, it's hard because you are trying to figure out who you are without that yeah. person that has been in your life for so long and, and who you're used to coexisting with. And I, for me, I went through multiple things um, to try to figure out like, how are we going to like keep, keep lifing and what's my life look like and, and a job and just in general, who am I without him? Exactly. Um, and you know, what you liked isn't necessarily what you're still going to like. Nope. Because you liked it because it, you were doing it with him. Yeah, absolutely. I, I started um, taking um, an art class and I joined the local art club. I can't draw stick figures. My <laughs> husband was the artist and I was always jealous of his talent because he was really good. And um, so I think that's why I did it. Partly because of the socialization part of it. Um, it got me out of the house once a week. And um, so that was good. But I think it was the connection to him. Yeah. And so a bunch of different things happened. And I heard about life coaching. And the course, the courses that I pulled up, the very first one I saw was a life purpose coach. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my goodness. I said, I took it for me because I needed a purpose. And I thought maybe this will help me figure, you know, show me a way to figure it out. Well, by the end of it, I realized that I knew everything I was learning. They, they were teaching. I just didn't apply it to myself. You know, it was all stuff that, you know, when, when you raise six kids, you know, you learn things, you know. <laughs> Okay. And it, and I love to give advice. <laughs> so I learned a lot through it. And I learned, um, I started learning who I was. And I realized that, that my purpose was to help other people going through the same thing. You know, not knowing who they are, not having a sense of purpose, forgetting how to dream. Mm -hmm. Because when, when your husband dies, or your wife, the, the future you thought you were going to have together is gone. Absolutely. And it's hard to, to think of five years down the road. So you don't, mm -hmm. you know, you, you cut yourself off and say, you know, it's, it's hard enough to think about tomorrow. And I finally figured it out that, yeah, I, I, I figured out who I was what I like is who, who I am. is not who I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I would be one of these um, free spirit type of people. And, <laughs> Feel that. and you know, yeah, I want to be, I want to be um, charismatic and have everybody, you know, just, Oh, Cindy's here. <laughs> I am. That's not me. That's not me. Yeah. You know, I, I don't mind being a little bit in the background, um, you know, especially in a group. I'll take charge if nobody else does. But, you know, so I, I learned a few things about myself. And so who you, who you are isn't necessarily who you want to be. And that's okay. And that's it, not you who know, you was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's okay. Anything, everything is okay. I also realized that the past is in the past. I have memories, but I'm not living my former life. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. It's okay to create a good life for yourself. It's okay to be happy. Do you feel, I love my life. I, I personally am in a good place, um, but I think getting there is hard. And I think a lot of people do struggle with um, being happy after the fact or living a better life. Um, I think you 
there's part of you that feels guilty if you're happy after you're lost. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I've had, I've had people tell me that. And my answer is, did he like you? Did he like it when you had fun? Did he love, did he love your laugh? Did he do things to make you laugh? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, almost every time. So that's your answer right there. You're, you're not disrespecting his memory. You're honoring it. Yes. But by you, you can use the the grief, what you learn about yourself during the grieving process, you can use that to create a better life for yourself. Grief makes us stronger, makes us more resilient. Okay. It makes us brave if we allow it to, if yes. we open up and accept that. I never would appear on camera with a microphone before. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, yeah. It just was, I'm going to Ireland in two weeks. That's all my by story. myself. Yeah, by myself. And um, I never would have done something like that, you know, when my husband was here. You know, it just, I couldn't even have dinner in or, or, or lunch alone <laughs> in a restaurant, you know. And now it's fine. I, the thing I ask myself is, what's the worst that can happen? And when I think about the worst thing that could happen, it's not as bad as the worst thing that actually happened. Yeah. So I can handle pretty much anything now. And if we allow ourselves, we can get to that point. Absolutely. So how did you... So you started with the life coaching part and then now you do grief coaching and you said you started with widows only, but now you extended that. So how I am, I also am certified as a grief doula. So oh, okay. I do have some, some training in grief. It's not just, just my personal experience. Yeah, absolutely. So is this, is, are you like listed somewhere where people can find you or how does, I guess, how that process play out and because a lot of people you know if they're looking for a therapist they know where to go to look for that right but yeah. this is if you can um maybe explain the difference between a therapist well, and what you do a therapist and a counselor they have letters after their name mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't have any letters after my name um they can prescribe medication some of them and um i can't do that I can't accept insurance. You know, insurance doesn't cover life coaching. It really should. It should. It really should. Um, a therapist or a counselor, they're more talk therapy, most of them, where they basically just listen. They might mm -hmm. ask questions, pull things out of you, but that's, that's all they do. They don't give you any skills to get through things. As a life coach, I don't really care what happened when you were a child. I mean, we'll we'll delve into that a little bit, but, you know, because that does, you know, it formed who you are today, but I deal more with today mm -hmm. and I will ask questions about now and I'll help you if you don't have a goal in mind. I'll help you focus on a goal, baby steps. It can be a little, you know, having lunch in a restaurant by yourself, you yeah. know, it's little goals that can lead to a bigger one. And I will help you um, create the steps and I'll be your sounding board. I will be, basically I'll be your best friend. And, um, but you pay me. <laughs> But that's, you know, I, I, I don't tell you what to do. I help you figure out what the next step is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's much more um, empowering to you than, because I went through, I went to a counselor or a therapist mm -hmm. and it really didn't do much at all. And I hear that a lot. I hear yeah, that a lot. I did. Yeah, I went to groups. 
Yeah. And I think counseling or therapists work for di- different people. For me, it didn't. But I also feel like a lot of therapists haven't been through what you've been through. So, yeah. grief, you know, grief or loss of a husband for me. I had a younger therapist, which he was very, very nice, but he's probably not ever dealt with grief a day in his life. Whereas I feel like a lot of the coaches, there's a reason and a purpose. Something brought them there and Mm -hmm. they're more than likely to have those life experiences and fully understand what you're going through because they've been there. Yes. We joke that our clients are who we were before. (laughs) And most coaches in anything, you know, whether they're a fitness coach or um, a financial coach, you know, all, all different kinds of coaches. Generally, it's because they went through something. Absolutely. You know, they just want to they want to help others make it easier. I can't take anybody's grief away. No. You know, it's I can't erase it. It will always be with you, but I can make it easier to manage. And um you know, by helping you learn to dream again, by helping you learn who you are, and then finding your purpose, and then living your purpose. And, you know, so those four steps make it easier. And I think the the sooner you start on those steps, the quicker it gets easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, um, I mean, you have to, you have to feel your feelings first. That's the biggest thing you do and And, i think that's um that's huge because a lot of people don't a lot of people just want to tuck it away yeah see i i felt mine more um and through journaling and um a couple really good books and then myself taking the life coach course um all of those helped me work on me and help me really feel the things that I was going through. And I think that's a part of how and why I'm, I feel like I'm in a good place now and that I can have these conversations um, and want to help other people and not everybody, you know, everybody grieves differently and some people tuck it away and some people deal with it for years and years, like hardcore can't, can't function. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I I tucked it away. I mean, I I I did the active grieving for maybe the first month, and then after that, I just kind of I didn't want my sons to worry about me. So, well, I don't cry in public. I don't like to cry in public. I did cry at the funeral. Boy, did I cry at the funeral! But um, other than that, I they didn't really see me cry. Mm-hmm. They didn't really. I did. I did it all in my car. <laughs> yep. And I, would, I, I took away to the bathroom. <laughs> I would, I would yell at Dan. I would yell at God. Yeah, I did that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, and God understands, you know, that's, he, he, he's got broad shoulders. He can mm-hmm. handle. It. Yeah. There, there was a lot of that, but it wasn't done when they were around. Uh, I've yep. got two adults, two of my adult sons live with me. Um, and I don't know what I'd do without them. <laughs> I think I think regardless of their age as a mom, mm-hmm. I feel like you have to um yeah, yeah, you have to protect that and you have to deal with your things in your own way and not for mm-hmm. them to see too much of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean as they're growing up, you know, oh mom's never sick. Well, yeah, she is. She just continues being <laughs> mom. <laughs> Yeah, no other choice. Right. And um, oh, the people would tell me after Dan died, "Oh, you're so strong." I'm just doing what needs to be done. You know, I know, like, and that was, I heard that so many times. Was I don't know how yeah. you did it. I'm like, what was my other options? Like exactly. What, what was I? Was, was, what else? One, could day, I one day at a time, and some days it was one minute at a time. Absolutely, because you know, he was. He died from um, stage four lung cancer, which was diagnosed on Mother's Day in oh, May. No. And um, he went into the hospital and never came out. 
he died on August 2nd, 2011. And I stayed in the hospital the whole time with him. You know, they, they had a bedside sofa thing that pulled right. out. And then, so I stayed there and my sons brought me up clothes. There was, a, you know, private shower. It was, their oncology floor is really nice. Um, you know, private room. And um, so when after the night he died, I went, I don't remember the trip from the hospital back to my house. I don't know if I drove. Somehow my car got there, but I don't, I don't remember it at all. Um, but I remember standing at my door with my back to the door and saying, I can't go in there without him. And I, that's when I broke down. I didn't cry when he died. It was the idea of going into the house because the last time I was in the house, he was with me. Yeah. So obviously I made it into the house, but it is, that's one thing I want to tell, especially people who are new to grief. It's okay to not be okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I ended up with a bleeding ulcer because I, I kept everything inside after a while. Uh -huh. um, I want my sons to worry about me and probably would have done them a favor if I had allowed them to see me grieve because they didn't appear, you know, they, they did everything in private too. And because they didn't want to upset me. And we, we need to open up and we need to be more honest with each other about our feelings. They didn't especially, know. How I especially when, um, you know, like it's you and your sons, you know, and, or, uh, the group of friends that are close when everybody's grieving the same person, the same thing. I think a lot of times it's that people don't want to say something because they don't feel like their grief is as bad as your grief or, yeah. and the reality is if we all talk about it, we will all be better. Off. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because when most people, when, when we talk about grief, you get together with other widows or whatever, it's not, they don't want to tell their story because they don't, they don't want to play the, my grief is worse than your grief game. Like sometimes people do with um, illnesses, you know, oh, well, when I had the flu, you know, I was in bed for three days, couldn't move. And somebody else was, well, I was in bed for a week, you know, and it's, yeah. you know, the, the nothing. And we, we, when we're grieving, we don't want to do that. Mm hmm um we you know so we keep it a little more private when we should be sharing our stories um we should be talking about you know our husbands our wives whoever we lost i lost my father 10 years to the day before my husband died my father died august 2nd 2001 my husband died august 2nd 2011 oh wow and I say he did it on purpose because he knew how bad I was with dates. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a possibility. Um, but I, it was also, all six of my sons happened to be there. And so we went out and we interviewed funeral homes and because I knew it was coming. Yeah. And we... Um, but so when we got back, you know, I told Dan, he was basically comatose at this point. But I told him, you know, I said, everything's, everything's ready. So whenever you're ready. And he died that night. He, I was standing by his bedside, holding his hand. He opened his eyes, looked at me, and then slowly closed his eyes and he was gone. Oh. And I... For me, that's such a beautiful memory mm -hmm. because it, it wasn't agony. Six years later, when my mother died, I was there with her when she died. They took her off a respirator and her body just started gasping for breath. And it was that not. Is awful. That is the worst. I, I think yeah. that is the worst type. Um, yeah, it was the same the same with my grandfather and that is like the last memories I have yeah. and it just was an awful experience and I had such guilt I still have to battle it and push it away um 
because I was the one that was there with her. They, they intubated her without my knowledge. And I knew she didn't want that. Mm -hmm. And I would have fought it. Um, they, there were other ways they could have helped her. They didn't need to sedate, you know, completely sedate her and um, put her on the respirator. We left her there for about a week. I mean, I was there every day sitting by her bedside. Luckily, I had a job that, you know, I was already working from home. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I could work anywhere I had an internet connection. And finally, I said, this, this is enough. The, you know, the doctor said she's not going to be able to breathe on her own. And so I said, ease up on the sedation. I want to talk to her. I want to make sure she understands. And, you know, I told her, I said, do you want that? Cause she, she kept saying, you know, put like pulling at it mm -hmm. and I want that out. And she nodded. I said, you know, that if you, if they take it out, you probably won't breathe on your own and you'll die. And she nodded and I said, is that okay? And she really nodded, you know, that's what she wanted. So, but they didn't sedate her very much not enough and it, yeah it was not a it was not a pleasant death no yeah. but that was that was um, 2000 friday the 13th 2013 <laughs> dates and for us it really <laughs> so yeah so it's been um 10 years it doesn't seem like it was that long, but it was just, it was just two years after Dan died. It's so crazy how sometimes it feels like it's forever ago when sometimes it feels like it was just yesterday. And then sometimes, I mean, I'm just two years in and sometimes I'm driving down the street and I'm like, oh, I can't, I'll, I'll just have a, like a thought. And I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't go home and tell him that because he's, he's not there. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to know um, what time of day I was born. And because somebody wanted a human design. Have you heard of that? Um, I think like, so. It's like astrology, but not. <laughs> and um, but it's based on, you know, where you were born, the time of day, you know, the time and of course the date. And I had my birth certificate, but it didn't have a time on it. And I thought, there's nobody left that I can ask. Yeah. You know, there's nobody. I have, I have two aunts, but, you know, they weren't there. Yeah, they would know. So, yeah, I don't think they'd remember. I haven't asked them, but, you know, it's, it's strange. You know, I am now the, basically the matriarch of the family. I have three brothers, but I'm the only, only girl. So now I'm. They've called me, you know, I'm the matriarch. I'm the queen bee. <laughs> well, you know, when my granddaughters, they're, they're still young, but they're kind of past the princess phase. Yeah. But they were really big into the princess phase. And I said, why be a princess when you can be a queen? You know, be the one in charge. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I don't know why every little girl wants to be a princess. I always wanted to be the queen. <laughs> Well, now you're in charge of all the things. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's grief is, you know, and we've lost animals, you know, pets that we'd love. Um, losing a job can bring on grief. Losing a friendship, whether it's, you know, because of a misunderstanding, an argument, or maybe just because you moved uh -huh. or you just kind of you know, grew away from each other. You grieve for that friendship. You yeah, know, there's so about. many different ways and of and there's so many different forms of grief that I think a lot of people don't understand. And when I started this, I wanted to hit on that and make sure that everybody knew like even if you're grieving a friendship or what was or what could have been, that's still grief. And we still want to talk about it here because it's all important. It's all still a type of grief. And 
you know, what you may be going through, someone else may be going through and not knowing how. So any type yeah. of information or talking about that, that could help anybody. I'm here for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's all we need. Mm -hmm. We just need you know, two ears to listen. And um, that's what I try to do. You know, when somebody is, especially if they're new to grief and they come to me, you know, I listen, you know, the first thing on my podcast, I have a podcast as well called the good grief podcast. Okay. I, I interview people who have gone through grief and made something good come from it. Okay. You know, it, it whether it's in their own lives or, you know, in the world in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have, you know, some podcasters, they have a list of questions and that kind of thing. All I do is I say, okay, tell us your story. And they run with it. You know, everybody wants to tell their story. And I think that's important. And that's why I wanted to do mine that way too, just kind of conversational style, because it's real. It's not scripted. Um, I don't go through and edit the stuff. I just push it yeah, because yeah. I think where people can relate to us better that way. Um, because at the end of the day, we, we've all been through some type of grief. We're all dealing with something and the words of someone else. You never know what someone else is going through. So those right. words may resonate with anybody. And I want that to come naturally to help other people. Yeah, it's grief. I mean, it's different, but it doesn't mean it's better or worse. You know, yes. it's the grief I feel for my parents, even even for the grief I felt for my father was different than what I felt for my mother. And both of those were different than the grief I felt for my husband. Yeah. Um, for my husband, you know, because he was part of my daily life. You know, I still, you know, it's like, I had to ask Dan, no, I can't. Yep. You know, I want to ask him something or I can't want to tell him something. He spent 12 years and I still do that. Um, so that that kind of thing I don't think goes away. And I don't mind it. It doesn't make me feel sad anymore. It's just, it's like, it's a memory that, yeah, he would have known the answer. And it makes Absolutely. me feel better. He, he was my problem solver. You know? mm -hmm. um, and he always thought outside the box he was and i miss that but he um when i think of him now it's it's not in sadness you know it's i'm happy to have those kind of memories and i used to have dreams where um he was alive but we were screaming and yelling at each other and he was cheating on me. He was leaving me and all this. None of that ever really happened. We had a very good marriage. We never <laughs> argued. We never got mad at each other and not talked for a period of time. I but feel we that. Never though. Raised our because we had, we had a great marriage as well. And we, we didn't argue about things. And yeah. then since he has died, I randomly have dreams every now and then. It's like. He's alive, but he's pissed because I sold his shit. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, what is happening? Well, I would have these these dreams. I'd have them like almost every night for like a week or two or three. And, you know, you wake up in the morning and you just, you feel like you've been through that argument. Yeah. And it, it would ruin my day. And, um, and I remember one argument, though. I said, I don't have to take this from you anymore. You're dead. Leave me alone. <laughs> and I didn't have the dreams again for several months. But now, now that I know who I am and I'm comfortable with who I am and, I'm, and I can talk about him and think about him without, you know, breaking down, when I dream about him, it's a good dream. Yeah. I had a dream the other day that we were going on our honeymoon. And that was really nice. Oh, we went, to, we went to Montreal. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, my my best memory, you know, when they say, you know, what what's the mem your best memory? It was our wedding day. Yeah. It was just perfect because both of us 
for us, the actual wedding was not important. It was what came after. It was the marriage. Uh And so during the ceremony, we're cracking jokes with each other. And I mean, we're laughing. I told my mother afterwards, I said, because I was laughing, my shoulders were shaking. I said, you probably thought I was crying. She says, oh, no, we knew you were laughing. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) And at one point I said, we better shut up. He hasn't actually married us yet. And the priest looked at me and went, (laughs) yes, you better start towing the line, girl. (laughs) Sounds like you and Dan had a fun life together. We did. We did. He he always loved to make people laugh. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot of memories that make that that make me smile, make me laugh. Um, and it's nice to be able to think about those now, without make without it making me sad. Mm-hmm. So and and that's that's what I want to help other people. You know, I want to get them to that point where. They're comfortable. I mean, I love my life now. I love what I do. I could talk about grief all day long, <laughs> which is weird, I know, but um, I love what I do. I love the people I I work with. I love the life I'm living. I'm I'm leaving for Ireland in two weeks. <laughs> that was that was always my son. my son made that possible. It was a, a Christmas gift from him. Um, but I love who I am. I am the most comfortable with myself that I've ever been. And would I give it all up if he was back? You bet. Absolutely. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So I might as well live a good life. Yep. You know, I could live, I could live another 10 or 20 years, you know, and I don't want it to be sitting in my robe in front of the TV. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, make the be- life is short. Make the best of it. Um, and that's what, you know, we try to, me and the kids still try to make as many as memories as we can and have fun. And um, because that's what we did with him. You know, we, he, he was big on memories and doing the fun things. And we try to continue to do that and um, to live, live our life. It honors his memory it when does. you, you're living your best life. You know, it's it's not dishonoring or disrespecting at all. You know, they wanted you to to be happy. They want you know, they loved hearing us laugh and so why not do it? You know? Yep, that was our thing was we wanted to continue to live the way that we were and the way that we had planned, um, mm-hmm. make the best of it and live our best life. Yeah. What are some of the things you do to honor him? Do you do anything in particular? Um, We do on his birthday, my son, who is 15, he has a memorial ride because they used to go ride side by sides and things like that. So he does a weekend where he does a memorial ride. And then the following weekend, do a cookout um, for his birthday and invite, you know, all the friends and family that were close to us. And then just, Every day, um, we've never been, we've always made sure that we talk about him often. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we never just tuck that away. So we're, we're always talking about either memories with him or what he would do or bring up his name. So that's, that's something that's a constant for us. Yeah. I have a list of things that friends can do for somebody, Mm -hmm. you know, if you have a friend or relative who's, who's, you know, become widowed, what can you do to help? And one of the things is talk to them, say their name, say, you know, their loved one's name, their husband or wife, say their name. Because, you know, people, people, oh, I, I don't want to bring up bad memories. I don't want to make her, you know what, we're still, we're thinking about them anyway. You know, as well talk about him. And I think that's huge. I think that was huge in our healing process was talking about him often. Yeah, that's, that's what, you know, my family and his always did, you know, Mm -hmm. we, his parents both passed, um, his father died early. Um, He was 56 or 57. Um, We'd only been married like three years and he was a wonderful man. 
he he's the one that made me want to go to Ireland. He, we were going to go together someday. Oh wow! And um, so I'm going to take a picture of him with me. And but you know that was that was the first major loss I'd ever had. My grandparents were still alive, you know, except for one grandfather that he died when I was a baby. But you know, I, I hadn't lost anybody. And, and I think so that was one, and that came as a shock to me how I felt. Yeah, and I think it's different too because, like, your grandparents, you just at for me, like, I just expect your my grandparents to go. You know, they're yeah. older or, or whatnot. So I think the situation's different. Your your parents, of course, you expect them to go longer, um, but when you lose a spouse, I especially, especially. mine was forty, so. Especially at our age, I, you, there's nothing that could ever prepare you for that, like, ever in your life. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I was 54, and I didn't know any other widows except my mother. I didn't know anybody, um, and I didn't want to go to one of the, like a grief support group because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to sit in a room with a bunch of people crying. Yep. <laughs> I just didn't want to do it. And if if there had been a me available at that time, I would have been on it. You know, yeah. I didn't want to have, especially online, so I didn't have to leave my house. I am a bit of a hermit. <laughs> I, I will do whatever I can from my office. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an introvert that way. But, um, you know, if I'd been able to do something, you know, have, have coaching at that time, I wish there'd been a me went back when I needed me. Absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's hard to reach out for help, but find somebody that you can relate to in that, um, especially when it's, it's a spousal loss or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it's really good. The internet is wonderful. People ask me, you know, sometimes we'll ask, how do I choose a coach? And I, everybody's online now. Mm -hmm. you know, so they've got a, a Facebook page where they go live or, um, you know, maybe they do podcasts. You, you look at, you look at that and see, cause I'm not for everybody. You know, I, I, re I know that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, there are people who I am right for. Absolutely. And those are the people I want to help. And what I have to say, I love that you said journaling helped you. Oh, that was I did too. I wrote like. Oh, yeah, well, I've got um, a free grief, guided grief journal. And it'll give you prompts for letters for um, just a variety of different things. You know, write your favorite memory. And, you know, I tell people, take it. You may not want every page, you know, may not be for you. The ones that are your favorite, you know, print out 20, 30 pages of that. Yep. And I wrote letters to my husband um, every day, every other day, whenever I felt the need to for probably a solid six months. Yeah. yeah Just things really that I, I, you know, wanted to tell him or wanted to say or, um, and then, those on top of different type of journaling that was huge for me yeah, yeah. i i would the hardest for me was writing about my feelings because mm -hmm. i you know i never admitted feeling and um but that it was the hardest but i think it was the best you know you've got to feel your feelings you've got to to name them and if you can't name them, if you don't know exactly what it is you're feeling right at that moment, name it Fred. You know? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm feeling really Fred today. <laughs> you know? Okay. I like that. You know? So, yeah. And, um, and don't forget to laugh. It's okay to laugh. It's a good thing to laugh. It really does. Even if you have to fake it. Did you know that the act of smiling whether you mean it or not, the act of smiling releases dopamine in the brain and it makes you feel better. 
you know, you, you may not notice it right away, but, you know, they say, you know, fake it till you make it or, you know, yep. s- smile and, and it really does, it helps, you know, so this exercise and, um, yeah, and talking, you know, those are, those are all very good things that a new uh, widowed person can do. And I think just as it's okay to not be okay, it's okay mm-hmm. to be okay. Yes, yes. Both ways it works. And yep. um, you know, whatever, whatever you're feeling, you may have, you know, one day where you're, you're on top of the world, you just feel really great. And, you know, you wish your husband was there to share it with you. But um, it that doesn't ruin the day. But then the next day, something or someone, you, you never, sometimes you know what triggers it, sometimes you don't. Mm-hmm. And the next day may be horrible. You may have that kind of thing in one day. You know, it starts yeah. out great, then you, so good. <laughs> and it's great, and then it's not so good. I have a um, a meme that says it shows what how they say grief goes, and it's kind of a, a line, and it goes up and down, and that kind of thing. How grief really is, and it's just this whole big scribble. <laughs> yeah, it's a mess. That's how grief it's- there's no yeah. order. It's just a mess. Yeah. Yeah. The five stages. There's more than five <laughs> stages, first of all. Um, and they don't go in any kind of order. Mm-mm. And you may, you may think, okay, I've been through, um, you know, that one stage. So that's done. No, honey, it's not done. It's going to no. come back. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, find the second year. Was it harder than the first? I've heard some people say that. No, for me, um, for me, the first year was like a total fog. I have no idea. I I couldn't tell you what happened in the first year. Um, Mm -hmm. and then after that first year, we were kind of getting back to to life a little bit, and you know, learning learning the new the new new life i guess the new normal um and this year like almost two years to the day i feel like it's like we we can life again we can yeah you know fully move on and and be okay and um like i said i just feel like i'm in a good space yeah you've kind of gotten used to you know your routine your mm-hmm. new your, I, I hate the phrase but it works the new normal yeah that was that was so overdone during covid you know? yeah well we're gonna have to get used to a new normal but it it does describe it, it you know um that covid ugh, that gave us so many widow people it did yeah. and, and the, the I think for me, it was kind of a, why it was horrible situations that also, but it also gave us more time together for, for oh, my okay. household. It gave us more time with my husband. Um, okay. and we so had, yep. I think we had better quality time during that than we had in a long time. Do you mind if I ask what he died of? Um, it's, he died of a stroke. Oh, um, so it was. But so his death was unexpected. Definitely un- unexpected. Um, he did have COVID. He was on the tail end of it. Uh, his mother died the same day. They died within 20 minutes of each other. She did die from COVID. They were not together. Um, oh so it was kind of kind of the instance of we got the phone call that she was probably dying, and then that kind of spiraled him to our situation and. Um, I'm at one hospital. My sister-in-law is at another hospital. We had all this going on. Um, so, yeah, it was a, it was a mess. I'm so, did they let you in to be with him? Mm-hmm. See, the, those horrible stories I'm hearing is, you know, people, they couldn't be with their loved one when they died. They wouldn't but, let them in. I think ours was a little bit different though, because we weren't in the, we weren't, it was two years ago. So we weren't in the mix of, you know, the hardcore 
COVID. Um, we're in a small town. So our little hospital, we were there two days prior for him being sick. So our little small town hospital wasn't like locked down. And um, we, we just weren't in that hardcore. Nobody comes yeah. in safe. Yeah. Yeah. My brother works at um, a large hospital in um, Syracuse, where I'm originally from. And um, they 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 ran out of beds you know yeah. they were having to borrow beds you know from other hospitals in the yeah. area and they tried you know very hard to keep the covid patients separate from you know the the regular population mm -hmm. it, was, it was a mess because they weren't ready for it yeah nobody does. you don't expect that kind of thing nope all craziness but yeah i think i think there was as much as bad i think it it also brought some people like i said it gave you that time um yes yes and i think that was definitely for us for family time and yeah, yeah but it was some of the best times i mean because prior to that we had multiple businesses so we were always on the go and uh, that gave especially him and my son more time um, to spend together and they would go ride in and things like that. That's good. Yeah. We were able to create good memories during that time. Uh -huh. That's wonderful. Well, I thank you so much for having me. Well, I appreciate you being on. I'm, I'm excited. You are my first widow, um, guest. Oh, and well, thank I, you. I'm honored. I appreciate you coming on and talking about your experience and what you do. Um, I think a lot of people could benefit from a life coach, grief coach, things like that. And I think that can resonate with a lot more people than maybe sometimes therapy do, does, because I think we all have this. Like I said, it didn't work for me. I have friends that absolutely love it and it works for them. Yeah. Yeah. But we're all One of my son is a therapist and he, he absolutely loves her. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's different for everybody. Yeah. And I think it's just finding what works for us. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody wants the guided grief journal, it's real easy. It's cindyjburns.com slash journal. And I'll put that in our I'll put that in our notes as well. So that's there in writing if anybody wants that. And um you got anything else for us today, Cindy? I think that's it. I'm going to be I'm well I'm open a enrollment. It I I accept clients at any time, especially, you know, if you do want to do one-on-one, -on -one, but I do have a program um, that's a five-week program called Finding Yourself. And that's, that's open enrollment right now. Um, because I do, it, it turns into a group. So I don't take too many people into it. Um, cause it just gets too, too much to handle. I can't keep everybody straight and you know, <laughs> you know their names mm -hmm. um, and I like them to know their, you know, each other. Absolutely. There's, there's, yeah. It, there's a, a learning component that I released like on Monday or something at the video. Um, there might be a little bit of homework, nothing major. And then later in the week, usually a Thursday we get together and it's a, group session so either talk about what went on you know in from their the lesson that they had on monday or life in general you know whatever's going on in their lives so yeah you can reach me at cindy at cindyjburns.com that's my email perfect well i appreciate you being on and we're gonna go ahead and end this uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time.